Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Be seated. In the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, St. John introduces us to two powerful signs. The first sign is that of a woman pregnant with child who, as it turns out, is Mary, but she's more than Mary. The second sign is a great red dragon who we learn is that ancient serpent of old, the devil himself. Now in a very graphic and unforgettable scene, the text reads like this. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. As in, are you ready for this? Bite into the head of this baby as soon as he crowns, rip him from his mother's womb, crush his head and gobble him up like a snake with an egg. Yeah, that's how graphic that scene is. By St. John actually describing the dragon as that ancient serpent, that takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve and the devil, they all learned that the Messiah would come forth from the seed of a woman. But a woman doesn't have a seed. Well, that was a little clue. It was a little breadcrumb, if you will, that the Messiah, the Savior, would come forth from humanity, wrapped, as it were, in human flesh. And this God-man, this Messiah, he would eventually crush the devil's head. And what the devil has attempted to do since way back then is crush the Messiah's head before the Messiah crushes his. For example, who inspired Herod's mo murderous attempt to kill all the baby boys born in Bethlehem just before the Holy Family got out of town? Who inspired that? The dragon. Who was behind Judas's betrayal of Jesus? The dragon. I mean, Jesus even said in John chapter 6, verse 70, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Who caused that great storm to come upon Jesus and his disciples? So much so that experienced fishermen growing up on the water were scared out of their wits. That was the dragon's handiwork. And you can start from Cain and Abel, and you can track so many times, numerous times, where the devil, the dragon, attempted to devour the child and eliminate the seed of the woman. My point is, beloved, that is exactly what we have going on here in our gospel text this morning. This dispute, though it might seem tame and mundane to you, though it might be something that somebody like a financial guy like Dave Ramsey, if you've ever heard of him, will take every example of money in the Bible and somehow or another use it to teach us better budgeting practices. No, this is yet another attempt by the dragon to entangle Jesus in his words, to get him to fall into the hands of those, as we know, they're already seeking to destroy his life and to eliminate him once and for all. It happens to be Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus is teaching in the temple, and this is his last public Teaching. The Pharisees, whom Jesus has pointed out their hypocrisy so many times before, they hate him, of course, because of that. They now join forces with a group called the Herodians. And their scheme is to entangle Jesus in a, 
you know, a catch-22. If he answers their question this way, he's doomed. Or if he answers his, their question this way, he's doomed, doomed as well. So it's perfect. Or so they think. Now, some background here. In 63 BC, the Romans made Palestine, the entire Holy Land, as we would call it, a Roman province, thus making the Jews ruled by Roman Caesars. Herod the Great was put on the throne and given the title King of the Jews. Now, when Herod died, his three sons took over. They were all still ruling for the Romans. And one son, by the name of Archelaus, he followed his father and he ruled in Judea for about eight years or so. Eight years or so. Now, he was so disastrous as a king that the Romans removed him and replaced him with somebody else. Now, look, for Rome, you got to be really, really bad in order to be replaced by them. But he was replaced. And they replaced him with a governorship. They installed a governor by the name of Pontius Pilate, who of course was the ruler during the life and the ministry of Jesus. Roman occupation was dreadful to every faithful Jewish person. They hated the Romans. Considering actually the Roman presence in Jerusalem and the Holy Land to be a punishment by God. And this is why they expected the Messiah, when he showed up, they expected his chief job to be to overthrow the Roman government. Think of it as being top, number one item on his call documents. To overthrow the Roman government and to set up an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem. And thus, the people, they expected a revolution. A revolution, of course, led by a great military leader who would raise up this army and then lead them into battle to overthrow the Romans. They wanted their Messiah to make Israel great again. Ever heard anything like that? We love that stuff. And it's nothing new. Nothing new. And this is why, too, in the eyes of the Pharisees, one of the worst things, well, one of the worst things for a Jewish man to be was a tax collector. But another horrible thing for a Jewish man to do was to be sympathetic to Roman occupation. To politically take the side of Rome. I mean, how could anybody do that? But some did. And the Pharisees had a name for these folks. It was actually a slur, but it was called Herodian. Those who followed Herod. Those who were fully on board with the Roman Empire being in charge. Those who fully said, Caesar is Lord. Had no pro they had no problem with that. They thought Caesar, they viewed him as God on earth. So you've got these two groups who normally stay separated from each other. They conspire together and present Jesus with the thorny issue of paying taxes. Again, if Jesus says, don't pay your taxes to Caesar, he is a false god, the Herodians would lose their minds. For not to pay taxes to Rome was an act of rebellion. It was treasonous. And they would report it to Rome and they would have this man incarcerated as a rebel. Yet if he says, sure, pay your taxes to Caesar, the Pharisees would charge him with idolatry. And the people who resented the Roman presence, they would turn against him, concluding, Just, Jesus isn't the Messiah. He's not going to lead a rebellion. Ergo, he's not our God. He's not the one we should be waiting for. So again, I think you get it. Either way, if Jesus says yes or if Jesus says no, he's in trouble. So with that in mind, with the human element standing in front of Jesus, and then the satanic element standing behind that, 
Because just like God uses means, the devil uses means too. So with that, rolling around up there, listen to it again. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Now interestingly enough, what they say is true. It's all true. But this flattery is deceptive. It's just like Judas without the kiss, really. They say Jesus is true and teaches the truth, but they don't believe him. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And there's the trap. Is it in accordance with the law of God that we should pay taxes to the emperor? But Jesus, the text says, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test? Now think about this for just a second. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness three times? And there was one time where the devil came at him and offered him something, and Jesus said, Do not put God to the test. He's referring to himself. Do not put God to the test. He says it right here. He, he sees past these, this human element. He sees what's going on here. He says, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? He knows the dragon is behind this plot of entanglement, and he says, show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. My guess is the disciples of the Pharisees, they don't even touch it. It's got to be a Herodian who would touch it. A Herodian hands it to him, and Jesus said to him, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And so with one line, Jesus not only shuts the dragon's mouth, but he undoes the wicked scheme of these men. Getting really, even for us today, at both our relationship to Caesar and our relationship to God, doing so, as I say, in one fail swoop. First, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Now this really touches on the minor point here. But it does touch briefly on our responsibility toward civil government. Whoever the Caesar happens to be at any particular time and place in history, they need taxes to run whatever government, whatever form of government happens to be in place. The government may be doing a good job or a bad job with those taxes. They may be collecting too much. They might be uh, t collecting too little. They might be um, allocating resource or uh, monies to certain things that we don't find uh, important. But the point remains, nations need governments and governments collect taxes. It's just what they do. Caesar needs them and he demands his denarii and that's just the nature of the world in which we live. Yet Jesus he goes beyond taxes and Caesar and says this, render to God the things that are God. Which has everything to do with how we receive or re reject this God-man who speaks, namely Jesus of Nazareth. See, the coin that Jesus was holding, that they gave to him and that he's holding, it had the image and the name of the emperor upon it. And you recognized it as such. You received it and you used it for however you needed to to operate in that kingdom. But as I say, the coinage bore the image of the current Roman emperor and the inscription gave his title and his name. And most likely it was Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And did you catch that? The Roman emperor claimed to be divine, the son of the divine 
Augustus. Jesus is holding this coin out in front of them, but look past the coin to the one who is holding it. They have observed Jesus' person and his ministry for several years now. They have seen his deeds. They have seen these deeds of divine mercy. They have heard his words, words of heavenly wisdom. And so now the question comes, whose image and inscription does he bear? Forget the coin. Whose image and inscription does Jesus bear? He bears God's. For Jesus' words and Jesus' works attest most clearly that he is indeed the son of the living God, the only one there is. So friends, even though Dave Ramsey would use this as a you know, budgeting technique, this is a call to repentance for them. Why, oh why, do you Pharisees and Herodians not receive Jesus as the Messiah? Believe on him as your king. Believe on him as your deliverer from heaven. He who has not come to deliver you from Rome because you've got far greater enemies. Namely, sin, death, and the devil. Beloved, that would be the right way to render to God the things that are God. To believe in Him whom He has sent. For He is the image of God and His inscription is the Son of God. But then how does our text end? The last verse. When they heard it, they marveled, which is great. But then this last little bit, and they left him and went away. They left him. No repentance that we know of. Reminds me of the verse, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Even though Jesus confounded the Herodians and the Pharisees in the temple area that day, that did not stop them at all. The dragon would inspire them to strike again. Yet here's something very beautiful about this. Even though, you know, you've got this, you've got this defenseless baby, going back to Revelation, thinking back to that, you've got this defenseless baby, and then you've got a dragon. Later, John would say that this same defenseless baby is a lamb. Think about that. A lamb versus a dragon. You would think there's no, there's no contest between these two. But Jesus told us this in John chapter 10, verse 18. No one takes, and he says it. He's referring to his life. No one takes my life from me, including the dragon. No one takes my life from me, he said, but I lay it down of my own accord. This means the dragon would never be successful until Jesus wanted him to be successful. And thus, what started on Tuesday with Jesus' last public teaching Later on in that week, he's going to allow it. They will come for him. They will steal him out of the garden while he is at prayer. They will drag him before Pontius Pilate, and they will hang him on the cross. Entangle Jesus in his words? Never. But what Jesus allows himself to be entangled in? He allows himself to be entangled in a thorn of crowns. And he allows himself to be entangled upon a Roman cross. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. He even did it for the Pharisees and the Herodians. He did it for those who left him then. And he did it for those who leave him now. Jesus is the one who renders to God the things that only he could render. 
payment for all of our debt of sin. And that, my friends, is a tax that we could never pay. But he does. And he declares in his dying breath, it is finished or paid in full. And that the debt is now paid in full is shown when Jesus then arises from the dead, offering life and peace and an eternal salvation unto you. And when he rises, he promises that you will rise too. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We stand together.